Amen. Today we're going to uh, talk about what is this day, which is October 31st, which is what? It's Reformation Day. We talked about it last week. A lot of people, even in the church, do not know that October 31st is Rep Reformation Day. Uh, it is it's typically, if you ask a person, they say it's Halloween. And, uh, you know, my, uh, if you've re read through some of the materials I've h handed out, you come to the conclusion, I think it's, there's no other way to uh, look at this and say that is, that day is, originates in evil. It has to do with death and skeletons and fear. And if you watch any, if you look at TV, you'll see that the, what they promote now is all these horror movies. It's all, you know, there's all Halloween, one, two, three, four, and five, and it's the, you know, the ax murder and the chainsaw guy and all kind of very sinister things. It, there was a little uh, advertisement for whatever the channel it was, and I was watching something else, and, and you're watching this, the fear that they generate through these movies about people hiding in the darkness and coming, and, and to, to watch that yourself would be, what are you thinking? And they'll put children in front of those movies, and then the child grows up and they say, I don't understand why I'm so afraid. Well, it's obvious. So that day is intrinsically, from its origins, uh, is, has no godliness in it. It's an ungodly day. There's, no, there's nothing in the Bible that mentions it, obviously. You know, we have Christmas and, and Easter, which are, you know, there are biblical reasons for those holidays, the focus of those, but not this day. And the other uh, thing that amazes me is that this day, the Reformation Day, is the most significant day in modern church history. You know, since the, since the uh, Pentecost, since the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, that day is, is if you go out through all history, that day is, is probably the most significant day because of what took place there. And then the, the one day that the enemy chooses to steal, because he's a thief, is that day. And he's done a pretty good job on it, again, because most people in the church are totally unaware of the of the miraculous uh, events that took place at the Reformation, which began with one man, and his name was Martin Luther. There was a lot, there was more uh, kind of behind that. There was, there was some other events that took place. There were other individuals that were very prominent. Uh, John Wycliffe, he, uh, he was a, a, about 100 years earlier than that, maybe not quite that much. John Huss, he was, uh, uh, he was martyred. They burned him at the stake. Uh, John Wycliffe, he actually died of a stroke. Uh, and he was rewriting, he was translating the Bible from Latin into English because in the Roman church, nobody could read Latin, or very few could read Latin, but the priests were, had education so they could read Latin, but the common folks could not read the Bible. And they didn't have, uh, they didn't have copies of the Bible because they had to be handwritten. Uh, and so Wycliffe, he, he translates the Bible into English. Well, later, you know, I don't know how many years later, I think it's like, oh, 72 years later, the Roman church is so angry that he did that, that they dig up his grave, his bones, they dig up his body and burn it into ashes and crush it and throw it into the Thames River or wherever they were, they throw it into the river. That's how, that's a, that's a religious spirit right there. See, that's a, re a religious spirit always has a spirit of hatred to it and murder. You know, Jesus said, if you hate your brother, it's the same as murder. But they did actually murder people. So uh, then two major events took place or an, ind an individual and an invention took place at 15. We're talking 1517. That's when Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg. And all as he was doing, he, he had gotten a copy of the, of the Bible. He was a priest and he he's, uh, was training as, as a priest and, and became a monk. Uh, and he's reading the Bible and he reads Galatians, the book of Galatians, and he finds this verse that says, the just shall live by faith. And, and that took his attention and he began his pursuit and his study. And he writes the 95 questions and they primarily have to do with, are derived out of the book of Galatians. But the, the central theme, the thing that really, really uh, motivated him was the practice of selling indulgences during that period of time. I'll talk to you about it in a moment. 
And so he writes them up there, and that sparks the Protestant Reformation because people copied them, and they started to, you know, 95, but there were questions. He's saying, I, I, would just want to, I just want to open a dialogue with the church so we can explore some of these things. Well, here we go on that journey, and they, they, got, they got very, uh, very aggravated and irritated by, by him questioning them uh, and their doctrine. And they said, look, we've had these doctrine for so many years and uh, they're locked in and this is what we believe and you have no right, you puny little monk down there, to challenge the church that's been around for a thousand years. Who are you to do that? Uh, but he did and then, then it begins. Well, one of the other, the other, the invention that was now on the scene changed everything. And that is called the Gutenberg printing press. Now, <clears throat> Gutenberg printing, this is the first time they had a printing press called the Gutenberg printing press. Well, uh, I was up in uh, Atlanta. I got some free tickets to go to this. I just went by myself. Kathy couldn't go for some reason. I think your mom was around yet. And uh, this was uh, the, the, a display of, of Bibles from all throughout history. It, is like, it was like the Bible Museum. There's another name for it, but it wound up, it traveled all across the country and they would rent out these big warehouses and set this whole thing up and you would go through and look at all of these wonderful displays, like a museum. It's now in Washington, D.C., uh, in the Museum of the Bible. There it is in Washington. It's a huge, huge uh, uh, museum that people can go to. Well, I went to it while I was traveling around and one thing that was pretty impressive to me, they have a full-size Gutenberg press. Uh, there and you could see how, what that looked like. So, uh, uh, Johann Gutenberg, uh, jo Johannes Gutenberg, can't remember his first name. Uh, but see, God arranged that. See, the Lord is saying that this, where the church was going and how they had been developed over these years was filled with all kind of uh, doctrinal problems and and a mis uh, uh, untruth or. Uh, errors in it. So that's what we're talking about today. And in the back of your, uh, of your announcements, there are 12 doctrines of the Roman Catholic system that were in place then and actually are in place now. They've not changed the Roman system. And so the Lord wanted to correct this in the correction caused a lot of blood to be spilt, and we'll look at that in a moment. Number one, we won't take much time with this, was papal authority. The idea was the Pope was the only legitimate head of the church, and papal succession is, an un, is unbroken from St. Peter in the Bible, and he is the vicar of Christ and infallible, that he was the head of the church. There was no other, and, and he was set there by God. Uh, two is the priesthood. Only those men ordained through the church are true priests unto God. They alone may forgive sins or not forgive sins. So it wasn't God that was forgiving sins. He, his son died on the cross, but the priest would forgive the sins. Uh, one of the things, there was a tremendous amount of fear among the people at that time because th they were afraid that if a priest was their enemy or if they did something, that they would not have their sins forgiven or they would pronounce a curse on them. So the people were in fear of the priesthood uh, of not, uh, not extending uh, forgiveness to them. They said, no, I'm not gonna forgive you for whatever reason. And the, the people were, were walked in fear. Three was that a tradition. This is a, this is a significant one if you'd, of this list. It says, it is not scripture alone, but sacred condition that transmits in few, full purity God's word. So their tradition, whatever the Pope would de declare, uh, would be true because he was infallible. So you couldn't question the Pope. So if he spoke what they call ex cathedra, which means sitting in the chair, whatever he said was, is, was God's word. And they had a book of tradition, which was ultimately became the catechism. So that catechism, those, that list of, of doctrines was equal to the Bible and actually superseded the Bible because in many places there was a conflict. And when there's a conflict between tradition and the Bible, uh, tradition would, would trump that, uh, the, the Bible. So purgatory emerged and Mariology emerged and uh, veneration of the saints emerged and relics and the, the list goes on and on. Uh, the Eucharist was another one. That was when the, 
something called transubstantiation, when the priest would pray over the elements, those elements would become the actual body and blood of Jesus. And when you partook of those elements, Jesus was being offered up. You were killing him by chewing him up, and he was being sacrificed again and again. Now, in, in Hebrews, it says he died once for all, but Jesus is on the cross of a Catholic church because it is this, when you go to the church service, it's the sacrifice of the mass. Jesus is being offered up over and over again. Now, this was the doctrine that was of that day that, that, that Luther challenged. And these are still truths today of, uh, of the Roman system. And <clears throat> uh, the sacrifice of the mass, which was the, every, in every church, every Roman Catholic church, that is, that's what's happening. To not attend church is called a, uh, not a venial sin, but a mortal sin. They had, they had a list of sins. Some of them were small sins, venial, but some of them were major sins. And one of them was missing mass. If you were not at that mass, that was a major sin. You had to confess to a priest. Uh, and uh, number six was praying to Mary and saints. That was a big thing. A saint in the Roman system is... Someone who is acknowledged to have done mighty, you know, different works and maybe had a miracle. It was an individual, a man, who was prominent and they would then be voted in as a saint. And then you get a statue and you get to pray to that person depending on what their specialty was. Uh, a lot of folks have in their cars, they have Saint... Huh? Christopher. Saint Christopher in the car. So he is the patron saint of... Automobiles or travel, let's say travel. So you pray to that saint, uh, or you pray to Mary, who is an intercessor and brings your prayers to Jesus. Now the Bible says, "Now therefore, there is no, there is uh, there is no uh, intermediary between God and man except that man Christ Jesus." There's, we we pray to the Father through Christ by the Holy Spirit, but not in that system. You have to go to a man. In addition to that, there's a lot of statues that you pray to and. I was in, uh, in, in Madrid, uh, in Milan, at uh, the third largest church in the world. It was quite, quite a structure. It had 54 10-foot columns holding this thing up, and all inside of that church there were caskets of, of saints, of people who were you know, prominent people, but there's all dead people in that church, all throughout it, and people would go and pray to each one of these dead people. Then up the road was another church, and in that church, it was built in 374, which is just shortly after the uh, Constantine's uh, conversion, so to speak, and there was a big transition there, old, old church. And in the bottom of that church was, was a dead guy whose name is Ambrose, and I've told you that a number of times, and I it's an old church, and there was a one, what was there, that the people would pray for, uh, uh, forget what it was, but it was shiny and worn out because when the people came to that image, that relic, they would rub their hand on it for a special blessing, like a good luck charm. Uh, and, one of the, and, and I don't know if it was that church or one close by, but they, they thought they had the, uh, uh, the, the bronze serpent that was held on the staff by Moses. And there's the, the, the snake. Now, if you go to the Bible, it says they actually destroyed that. They, it, in the Bible, it says they destroyed it. But in that church, there was that. They said, that's the bronze uh, snake. And they would lay hands on that. So uh, a lot of unusual, you might even say b bizarre traditions, but they were very common. So anyway, we go in this church, and I went down behind the, the all, under the altar place. And there was Ambrose there in his little uh, priestly outfit. And you could see through the glass, you could see him sit, laying there. And he was the guy who, who came up with transubstantiation. So because he declared that to be so, it goes down into the book of tradition, and that's where it came from. So that uh, purgatory and other uh, doctrines that are not in the Bible become uh, truth to, the, to that religious system. So a confession of sins, you know... Uh, uh, confess to God, you confess to the priest who is then able to forgive your sins or not forgive your sins. And there are some scriptures in the Bible, if you use them incorrectly or isolate them, it's where they get some of these uh, doctrines. Uh, penance is interesting. You know, in the Bible it says for us to repent. Uh, in, a, in a Catholic Bible it says do penance. Now when you do penance, that means you have to do something to absolve you of your sin. You have to <clears throat> say a number of our fathers or Hail Marys or you ha you're assigned certain good works to pay for your sin. 
Now, of course, that's unbiblical because Jesus died for our sins and there's nothing you can do to pay for your sins, but that's, that's, what, the, uh, uh, that's what the tradition would ask them to do. So they would go to a, uh, to, uh, into the, to the priest that's got a little room there and they would confess their sins to the priest and he would say, to absolve you of your sins, you have to do 10 Our Fathers, you have to say Our, Our Father which are now, 10 times over and over, and then Hail Mary, full of grace, there was another prayer, and you had prayer beads. And these prayer beads, which were very pagan, that came out of a pagan doctrinal ideology, uh, you, would, you would count those beads. The, you know who has those too? The uh, Muslim faith has prayer beads. When we were over in, in Saudi Arabia, we saw these beads. I said, what are those? He said, they're prayer beads. Same thing as they have in, in Roman Catholicism. So you'd have to pray those, and then you would be absolved of your sin. You, you had to pay for your own sin. And we'll see in a moment something else. Salvation uh, in, the con in their doctrinal system is you got saved when you were baptized as a baby. <clears throat> when you're baptized as a baby, you are now a Roman Catholic, and you will go to heaven uh, if you follow the rules, so to speak. So... Uh, there's not, there's not, no preaching about being born again or salvation by grace through faith, not of works. That's not part of the system. You have to do the seven sacraments, and then at the end of your life, you've done all of your confession, you've done, you've done what you're told, uh, then you get to go to purgatory. Now, purgatory, it's, uh, let's jump down one there. Purgatory is an intermediate destination of Catholics where they are punished at varying degrees for their sin. Lighting of candles by relatives and indulgences can secure their early release. So if you're a Catholic, you're going to go to heaven, even though you may have to take this time, this intermediary time to be punished in purgatory. But you can, your family can light candles for you and say a prayer for you to get you out early. Right? That's why in the, when they had, uh, they still do have, in organized religion like Cosa Nostra, you know, all of those kind of... Uh, organized crime syndicates. They'd go around killing people, shooting people, stealing things, but they were all, what, what religion were they? They were, all, they were all from Italy, so they're all Catholics. So their idea was, we can kill people, steal things, and when we die, we will go to purgatory, but we've got people that can light candles. So all of the family, the family members, would light candles for them to get them out of purgatory. Now, this was entire, this was all of Europe, believe this. And the popes became so powerful because the belief system was the pope could curse you. And if he cursed you, you were done. You, they would tremble when that pope came in. Now, they, it's, it's uh, history how, how, how much wickedness and corruption there was in the popery of the time and what, what their activities were. Uh, but then it became the Holy Roman Empire in Europe where the 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 religious system was more powerful than the political system. It's called the Holy Roman Empire. They dominated the whole system. So now you've got Martin Luther living in this. Now, the, the, the thing what I want you to understand is the, the bravery of the man who takes a stand against it's speaking, speaking truth to power. You know, we hear that a lot, speak truth to power. That's what he was doing. But he just wanted to open a dialogue, in a, and it's a spark that sets the whole thing on fire. Okay? <clears throat> Mariology was, uh, is very strong today. If you go by a lot of churches, there's Mary on a pedestal of some sort. If you go drive on, I think it's, what is it, Route 4 down in Orlando, you go by uh, a church that says, uh, Mary, Queen of Heaven. Uh, Mary, Queen of Heaven, big sign on that Roman Catholic church. Now, uh, the, all you, do a search on that, and you can go to the book of Jeremiah, and you will see where the, the prophet, Jeremiah, is challenging the... Uh, the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people, on their worship of the Queen of Heaven. I mean, there's a number of verses there. I don't have them here, but that was a, that was a major uh, I, uh, uh, I, idolatry of the nation of Israel back in Jeremiah's time. And then finally, indulgences, which this was a beauty. Well, they wanted to uh, to build St. Peter's Basilica. Now, if you've watched a little TV, you see that big basilica there, and right in the middle is a Roman... Uh, uh, Art, not an arch, a, uh, not a statue, what is it? it is a, it's just a, a pillar. It is a pillar, and it's, and it's an Egyptian pillar right in the middle of St. Peter's Square. Very interesting. There's a lot, of, lot behind that. But, so they wanted to build this, so they came up with an, I, an idea, and, and here's what it was. If, if you wanted your sins to be forgiven, you will pay me as the priest, and I will then forgive you of a certain amount of your sins, depending on how much money you have. That was an indulgence. 
if you were very wealthy and you could really come up with some cash, I, I write off your sins and you have no sins in your life, you go directly to heaven. You don't have to, you pass, go, you don't go to purgatory because I'm going to write it off. And they had one guy there, I forget his name, but he was uh, John Tetzel. And he majored in this. He would go to cities and he would ha preach and he would say, as you bring in this money, your sins are going to be forgiven. And he was like a just a, a manipulating and deceiving the people. And they brought in the money by the boatloads and they built St. Peter's Basilica. Well, Martin Luther said, uh, well, here's what I want to ask you. Just a question. Since you can forgive sins, why would you just forgive the sins of the wealthy people and not forgive the sins of the poor people since you can forgive them? Why don't you forgive Everybody there says, if you have, you know, if you have that power and if you have the love of God in you, why don't you just forgive these, these poor people? Because Jesus loved the poor people. You only, well, this, this, they couldn't answer the question. So there is some application today because the devil doesn't have, you know, he's the same uh, today as he was back then. So now we still have the manipulation of people to give money for different causes uh, to their ministry and to build their buildings. Isn't that correct? If you go and watch a little something on TV, so he wants to build a, a, you know, some kind of a, a tabernacle for whatever, they will come up with a strategy to get the people to write the check and send it into them to build it. It's kind of, it's not quite an indulgence because you don't get the forgiveness of sins, but it's still manipulating the people for money. All right? So, <clears throat> I want to talk about the five solas of, and they're in the, in the front of your, uh, of your announcements, there were, these were the, the outcome of, or the result of the, of the Reformation was five major areas that uh, outlined and summarized what took place in the changes that took place from the Roman system to Protestantism. It, it was, some of it was called Lutheranism. And then there was a guy called John Calvin, and he had an influence. And then they had Calvinism. Some followed Calvin. It's a different doctrine than Lutheranism. But ultimately, it became known as Protestantism. And you are a Protestant. The root word of Protestant is protest. They were the protesters. They were protesting the religious system that, that Luther and others say it's not in the Bible. It's just not in the Bible. It's in your traditions, but they said it, the Bible rules. If it doesn't line up with the Bible, then we're not going to follow it. And they said, now you're going to die. Or you're going to be punished. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Number one is this, and we'll go through these fairly quickly. Because of the extra biblical doctrines and the papal decrees, because of that, sola scriptura, which means sola means only, scriptura means scripture. In other words, they said, we're not going with that catechism and with those uh, traditions. It's the Bible only, sola scriptura. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, every scripture, every scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration and profitable for instruction, reproof, conviction of sin, for correction of error, discipline, etc., uh, and uh, training in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.21 says, for the, for, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that was a key, that was a, a key uh, doctrine, doctrinal shift. And that was not going to settle it right with the, with the Roman system because they demanded adherence to, the, to their tradition. Secondly, there's five of them, because of the many religious requirements... The next one is sola gratia, or by grace alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. In other words, it's not by works. It's not by anything we could do. The Roman system, the religious system, it says you have to do something to earn your salvation. And Luther and the, the, the Reformation said, not, not, no, no, sir. Galatians 5, 1 through 4 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and do not uh, be entangled again in the yoke of religious bondage, basically. Behold, Paul saying, uh, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, now listen, he said, in other words, 
what they were doing is coming back under the Jewish law. He said, if, you get, if you're going to think you're going to get a pass to heaven or by doing that, that is going to secure heaven for you. He said, Christ is of no value to you. Now think about it. Then he goes on to say this. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. And Christ is become of no effect to you. In other words, if you add something, you say, it's Christ plus anything. He said, the whole thing doesn't work. He said, Christ has no effect. Some, I don't know if, if there's some religious systems that say, well, it's, it's Christ plus something. Uh, that's a dangerous doctrine. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. He said, if you want to be justified by some legal system, you're falling from grace. So that's why Galatians was the book, the Bible book of the Reformation. Because it's all about faith and faith in God alone. It's scripture alone. The third one is because of Mariology, because of the whole idea of this priesthood and the confessions and all of that, which was part of the system that we just outlined, uh, the next one is called Sola Christos. In other words, by Christ alone. There's not a priest, there's not there's Mary, any, any other, uh, uh, any other, primarily the priest, because they controlled everything. It said it's not by them, it's by Christ alone. We don't need a priest. We don't need a, an intermediary in heaven or on earth. It's our relationship is Christ. There's no, there's no mediator between God and man except that man, Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 21 through 26. I'll just read it to you. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. There is no difference. <clears throat> For we have sinned and short forward of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, in other words, a ransom sacrifice, that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So taking that portion of scripture, there's no place in there where you can interject or include some kind of uh, papal progression and priesthood that you need to get to God. It's between you and Christ alone. And the fourth one is because of the many laws imposed, sola fide, Sola fide, or fide, which is by faith alone, which is kind of included in some of these others. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith, uh, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believe in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by works, for all flesh will not be justified by the works of the law. Nothing you can do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And finally, because the Pope and the priest took the glory, they wanted all the uh, accolades, they wanted to be recognized, they wanted to be admired. Very similar to the, uh, the Pharisees in the Old Testament who wore all the, the special gowns and all of the, the special clothing, uh, and they had turbans, you know, and these gowns and uh, uh, other ornaments on their, in their clothing, that they would be recognized and admired, that they would receive the glory. Now, the glory is called, it's doxa in the Bible. Doxa, which means they would be given uh, as the position of a dignitary, or they would be given praise and they would be given uh, worship. <clears throat> Uh, Romans 4.20, Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. So all glory goes to the Lord. Man receives no glory. Paul again said, whatever you do, he said, do it all for the glory of God. That is the worship and adoration of God. Now, those are the five, uh, the five solas. It's good to, probably to remember them. 
now I want to talk to you about something called the Inquisitions, was, which was the, the, uh, the response of the Roman church. They said, well, what do we do with these people? They said, well, we, we have to stop this because it's infiltrating us and it's changing things out there and it's, it, it's, it's challenging our authority and our power. So <clears throat> you, can, you can buy Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's, got, it's about this thick with, with hundreds and hundreds of accounts of saints who were martyred. So here we have now a new world. We have the Roman system, and now we have these Protestant, these protesters, and they are, they are going by the Bible. And they're being born again. And they're just loving God. They're being saved by grace uh, through faith, and that's it. So they said, we've got, we got to do something with them. Remember, a religious spirit always has a spirit of hatred and murder con connected to it. And here's what they said. Heretics, <clears throat> anybody who did not endorse the Roman system and the catechism and the tradition. These became known as heretics. They came to regard it as enemies of society. Now listen to this carefully. The crime of heresy was defined as a deliberate denial of an article of truth of the Catholic faith and a public and obstinate persistence in that alleged error. In other words, you could kind of believe something, but just don't tell anybody, just don't go public with it. But when you get out, uh, everything is going to change. Uh, Pope Innocent III says this, anyone who attempts to construe a personal view of God, which conflicts with church dogma, must be burned without pity. Now, this is religion. This is Pope, uh, Pope Innocent III, and I don't know the years, but that was, that was their view of this. What, what was launched was the inquisitions. Of the, of the Roman church, and it went on for several hundred years in different places greater than other places. And what they would do is, they, is people would tell on one another and say, I know somebody in town here, and this person would say this, that, and the other thing, and they'd bring them before a tribunal. You had no representation, you assumed uh, uh, guilty, you could not prove you were innocent, there was, you had no recourse, you were totally under the, the domain of the, the Roman church. And you were then, if there was a, uh, uh, an accusation against you, you would then be asked to recount or recant uh, for your belief system. In other words, if you believe that one of these solas, it was through Christ alone or Scripture alone, you say, you, you, you turn back from that and you renounce that. And if you say, I'm not going to renounce it, well, now you're going to be punished. You're going to be punished. And their punishments were varied. We'll look at a, a few of them in, in, a, in a few moments. There is a modern, uh, there is a modern uh, version of the Inquisition's underway right now, and this is important for you to understand. In our country, probably other countries, but in our countries we see something similar, have a similarity to what happened many, many years ago. Those are the 1500s, 1600s. There is a new religion now has developed in America. There's a new, brand new religion. And the new religion is different from what we understand as a religion. It is a belief system and it's called progressive fundamentalism. And progressive fundamentalism uh, is, is expressed through uh, people, it could be political people, but it could be non-political people who have, a, who have a doctrinal system. So this progressive, it's kind of a, a political system, but it's a social system, and it's driven by political correctness. Uh, It, there is a, a belief system that's now accepted in the culture. Certain things are being imposed on the culture, uh, and, and they, they could be varied. But if, if, you, if you confront those, those distinctives or those doctrines, certain things will happen to you, and you will be punished in some way. One of the words coming up now is that if you, do, if, if you are on, let's say, Facebook or YouTube, and you declare something contrary, let's say it's about the, the mask mandate or the, uh, the vaccine mandate, and, and they, it's not according to the fact checkers, there's a dogma. See, there's a dogma, there's doctrine, and you are to come under that doctrine, and if you oppose it, you'll be punished. Now, the term now is you can be canceled. Say, we're going to take you out. Or there's character assassination. If you're in Hollywood and you are a Christian conservative and, and you speak about those conservative values, you're going to be canceled. 
If you're on TV and you're a, a comedian, there's a fellow there, I just saw a little article, and he said something that had to do with transsexuals. And he's a comic. And he made something that sounds funny, and uh, uh, he's canceled. Now the swords come out. But it's the same spirit. It's a new religion, is my point. And there are dogmas, and there are doctrines, and the enemy is behind it. And, and the point is, to, is ultimately... To put, for you to zip it and do not declare publicly what you are believing because you will be canceled, you'll be ostracized, you'll be mocked, you'll be ridicule, ridiculed. If you're in a, if you're in a school uh, and, and the Facebook thing goes out there, you're going to be a target. They had a, a, in a college, the, the, the person had a, a, a computer laptop and on it, he said, police, police life matters. So I said, police lives matter. And this group of people came over and they started to mock them and ridicule them and harass them and threaten them. Just because of that. Because it did not, it did not portray or uh, it, it was contrary to the dogma or the doctrine of, the, of this new religion. So I want you to understand that in a, you know, the, the kind of the plate where we are today with a new, a new, a different paradigm. And you could be identified as a heretic because you do not uh, submit yourselves to the, to the new doctrines. And this, uh, and this new religion controls the information. Just like the, uh, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, they had, they had a Bible that was written in Latin and you, nobody could read it. So you control the information. As soon as the information got out there, then the, then the persecution began. And it's the same with that on, on all of these platforms. Now, most, all of them are now controlled by the new religion. And that's trying to, you know, control and change uh, the culture. And there are people, it says, in the last days, brother against brother, sister against sister, they're going to tell on one another, they're going to report one another. And th when the persecution breaks out in the end times, the last, se the last half of the last seven years, people are going to turn on one another and turn one another in. That's what they did in the, in the Inquisitions. Same thing. They turned one another in and then the authorities came and took them away. Already that's happening in different places, uh, not too much in America, but up in Canada and Australia. They're, t they're arresting pastors because they are not, they are not obeying these, uh, these doctrines and dogmas of the, of the culture and they're arresting them, putting them in jail. There's a, a Polish guy, he came out of communism uh, and now he's in Canada. He said, I'm not, I'm not doing that. That's communism. You can't take my rights away. He said, oh yeah, we can. They, they, they left the church a little bit later. They came and they arrested him he's, and he's in jail. So uh, not, don't say, well, it can't happen in America. It's already happening. This new religion is already trying to take dominion over the, the, uh, the, the nation through punishment. If you're going to be punished, you're going to be persecuted to get you in line. Now, what's alarming to this is it, there is one of the most prominent... Uh, Faith preachers, one of the biggest faith preachers in, in our country. I was watching one of his messages, and here's what he said. Now think about how crazy this is. And he's preaching this message, and he said, the, the Catholic Church, when the Protestants came along, was the biggest church split. Now listen to the term. It was the biggest church split. He said, you're talking about a church split. That was a church split. Now that positions the Roman system as having legitimacy and saying the church then split. And these people who did this, you know what they're called? You listen to them preach on this. They're called protesters. Protesters. What do you mean protesters? We're supposed to be, have the love of God and here we are being called protesters. There's something wrong with that. Now he's mocking this day and the Protestant Reformation and Martin Luther and Swingley and Huss and go down the list. He's saying all of these people were, uh, and then he says this, this was driven, it was, a, it was a spirit, it was a spirit of division and it's now being pulled down because there are these enclaves where people are getting together and saying this Roman system and this Protestant system have to be healed and brought together to be one. Now that is simply saying this, in the end times there will be one world church. Everybody's going to come under a world church of some sort and that is the concept of it. We're all one. And this faith preacher is saying that was a spirit of division 
and he says, that demon, that demon has fallen. Now, I want to get your attention here to understand what's going on in the, in the culture. And in, in, in the Protestant church, he said that was a demon of division, and it's fallen. Now, the idea here is that uh, this protesting church was wrong. We just missed it, and we really need to put, come back under the papal system. But he's not doing that. But that's what he's saying. And, and nobody, everybody in the audience is clapping and cheering for this. And, and I am, you know, listen, I'm shocked by this. He's saying the, the religious, the papal system was a legitimate God's church. And that's what they'll say. There's anybody else, all, us out here, we're what they call a separated brethren. One of the separated brethren. Prominent. Influences multiple numbers of other big churches. Big, big, saying it's, it, this movement, what we're talking about today, was right from hell, right from demons, right from the devil. It was a demonic spirit of division. That's what he's saying. Biggest, biggest, big. That's what we're, we'll ultimately be up against, and that's what created the, this, the inquisitions. Because they say, no, I'm not belonging here. How big he is? And I don't say it because people get offended. All, you know, people get offended. They say, oh, no, uh, I'm not bound down to that. I'm not bound down to that. I know too much. That's why I'm teaching you this. Do you know how few people know anything about the Reformation? How many you know, can name the, the, the five solas of God just off the top of your head? They don't know the solas of God. They don't know the doctrines of that church and how, how powerful it is in the earth, in the Vatican. You know how big that is? And all of the wickednesses that come out of it and all the perversion, you know, all of the sexual uh, misconduct in there. It's crazy. So what they did is they say, here's how we're going to get you to obey. We're going we're to torture you until you give up. So they came up with a few things, Miss, uh, and I'll put them up on the screen here. How about, I'll give you just uh, a few of them. This was called the rack. And they tied ropes to your hands and your feet, and then the guys on each side would pull that with it would click, 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 click. And all of a sudden, you're, it, you, they get it to the point where your arms and your legs sockets would just pop out. They had one, I can't show it on here, but what they did is they tie a rope, tie your hands together and tie a rope here. And then over the top of the whatever, they, they kept some guy, and they pull you up off the ground with your arms this way. And then what they do is they drop it down real fast and then stop it. You go down, boom, and your arms, sockets would pop out. This, what, this, was, this, is called, this is what's demonic. That's demonic. Look at another one. How about this one? Okay, we're going to throw you, uh, here, we, here we go. Uh, we're going to give you a chance. Recant, turn back on that born again stuff. Th you, you think, oh, this, will, this is never going to happen. There, it is going to happen. Because that's what the Bible says. The Antichrist, who's behind all of this, it's coming again. That's why I said we need, we, you and I, we need to be all in on this. Because when, when, the, when the persecution really ramps up, I mean really ramps up, this is, mod, this is like very moderate right now. But it's, the system is in place. We pray that there will be a great revival that will dissipate it. But I said we need to be ready. Because look what they did. Say recant, recant. No, nope, you're not recanting. In you go. Let's show the next one. Here's a guy just praising the Lord. Just the old burn him at the stake. This is what John Calvin did to uh, Savitas because he didn't agree with his doctrine. John Calvin wrote a book. Savitas says, I don't agree with what you wrote in your book, Mr. Calvin. He said, okay, I'm going to burn you at the stake. But you know what he did? He didn't burn him with good dry wood. He burned him with green wood. So the green wood didn't grow up and smoke like that. It just smoldered and it just roasted him to death. Until the book, which, which John Calvin taped to his chest, burnt, caught fire and burned what, through his face. He screamed and, and went to eternity. You talk about sick religious people. When you've got a religious system, it's sick and it has a spirit of hatred and anger and murder in it. And there it is on public display. Get Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's got several hundreds of them in there. Go to the next one. This is my, this is my worst one, I think. You put them on the couch, tie them down. And then you put fire under his feet and burn the man's feet till he screams. It's not going to kill him. You're just going to burn his feet. And then you've got the most prominent faith preacher 
endorsing that Roman system. Now you think about it. And it'll get you to, to pray a little bit more about it. So, it's good to be free. Let me tell you that. It's good to have the truth. Because the truth sets you free. And that verse in uh, Galatians 5.1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty that has set you free. Amen.